Marxism and Freedom by Rhea Dunayevskaya. Chapter 11. Forms of Organization, the Relationship of the Spontaneous Self-Organization of the Proletariat to the Vanguard Party. The transformation of the ideal into the real is profound, very important for history against vulgar materialism. The difference of the ideal from the material is also not unconditional, not excessive. At the end of volume two of the logic before the transition to the notion, a definition is given. The notion, the realm of subjectivity or of freedom, freedom equals subjectivity or goal, consciousness, striving. That was a quote from Lenin. Marxism is a philosophy of human activity. The core of all of Marxism begins with and centers around the activity of labor in the process of production itself. It is here that the living laborer revolts against the domination of dead labor, against being made an appendage to a machine. Marx did not entertain any illusion that anyone can know the forms this revolt will assume before it actually bursts forth. No one's objective view, however, was more sensuous, that is using all senses, than Marx's, as witness his anticipation of the 1848 revolutions in the Communist Manifesto. No one followed the spontaneous self-organization of the proletariat with greater vigilance than Marx, whether in trade union form, Chartism, the First International, or the Paris Commune, they were the foundations for all his theory. He followed their development like a hawk and based himself exclusively on the intellectual development of the working class, whom he considered the only true inheritors of all the achievements of civilization, including Hegelian philosophy. But despite the close connection of his theory with the organizational activity of the proletariat, he never elaborated a theory of organization. Lenin did. In 1902, he wrote what is to be done. In 1903, the Russian social democracy split into Bolshevik, majority, and Menshevik, minority, tendencies. By 1912, these two tendencies became two parties. The book, followed by all his uncompromising organizational activity, earned Lenin every epithet from splitter to that of the alleged theoretician of Russian communist totalitarianism. No one is more anxious, spends more money and time to perpetuate this perversion of history than the totalitarian bureaucracy now ruling Russia. It has at its disposal the whole power of the moment when the Khrushchev bureaucracy destroyed the Stalin myth only to perpetuate the more heinous slander of Lenin as the precursor of their party, thus in fact maintaining and strengthening Stalin's elite party intact. There is no question that is more germane, not alone to the Marxist movement, but to the whole future of mankind, than that of the relationship of a Marxist party to the spontaneous movement of the working class. The phenomenon of the one-party state, which hangs over our age like a Democles sword with H-bomb power, appears to be the only alternative to bourgeois democracy. It is so pervasive a phenomenon, so full of tension and shock, or per purgation and death, that it very nearly suppresses all rational thinking on the subject. All the more reason not to permit any, any easy answers to soothe us back to complacency. What is needed here in place of our famous pra pragmatism is some Hegelian labor, patience, and suffering of the negative with which to trace the historical development of the Bolshevik party through every step of the way, from the time it was just an idea that an obscure revolutionary exile in Siberia was mulling over in his head, to the time when it was the party in power ruling over one-sixth of the Earth's surface and the obscure revolutionist was now the famous Lenin writing his will and warning of the ominous shadow of the rude and disloyal Stalin who had accumulated too much power in his hands and did not always know what to do with it. Only then can we face the modern phenomenon of the one-party state in both fascist and communist countries. 1. What was at stake in 1902-03, the activity of the workers and the discipline of the intellectuals. 
Lenin is rightly known as the founder of the theory of the Vanguard Party. Not that this was the first such party. The underlying conception of what has been called vanguardism belonged to the theoretician of the German social democracy and of the Second International, Karl Kotsky. Although, on party, the German social democracy was not a Lasallian, but a Marxian German social but a Marxian party. In its organizational practice, it was Lasallian through and through. Karl Kotsky, without due acknowledgement, it might be added, developed LaSalle's idea of the need to bridge the gulf between thinkers and the masses to its log logical conclusion. In turn, Lenin brought to its logical culmination Karl Kotsky's conception that the vehicles of science were not the proletariat, but the bourgeois intellectual. This permeates Lenin's statement that, by themselves, the workers could only reach trade union consciousness that socialism must be introduced to them from the outside. Lenin quoted Kotsky approvingly and at length. Socialist consciousness is represented as a necessary and direct result of the proletarian class struggle. But this is absolutely untrue. Of course, socialism as a theory has its roots in modern economic relationships in the same way as the latter emerges from the struggle against the capitalist created, created poverty and misery of the masses. But socialism and the class struggle arise side by side, and not one out of the other. Each arises out of different premises. Modern socialist consciousness can arise only on the basis of profound scientific knowledge. The vehicles of science are not the proletariat, but the bourgeois intelligentsia. It was out of the hearts of members of this stratum that modern socialism originated. Thus, socialist consciousness is something introduced into the proletarian class struggle from without, and not something that arose within it spontaneously. This guided Lenin in his fight against the ec ec econ economists who wanted to limit the proletarian struggle to economic demands, that is, to building unions. On this, both Bolshevik and Menshevik agreed. Nevertheless, the split took both took place. The blame was placed on the two differing conceptions, Martov's and Lenin's, of what constitutes party membership, whether it is sufficient to agree with party principles or whether one must be under the discipline of a local. But Martov's formulation had already passed despite Lenin's objections when the split into Bolshevik and Menshevik took place. Clearly something else must have been at issue, and it was. What is true, and it is this which modern students of the Russian party couldn't avoid sensing, is that there was an element in Lenin's theory on organization which was not borrowed from the German social democracy, which was specifically Leninist, the conception of what constitutes membership in a Russian Marxist group. Indeed, the definition did not merely rest on a phrase, that only he is a member who puts himself under the discipline of the local organization. The disciplining by the local was so crucial to Lenin's conception that it held primacy over verbal adherence to Marxist theory, propagandizing Marxist views, and holding a membership card. Undoubtedly, you have something in your head that is at sharp variance with the prevailing social democratic conception when you are that stubborn about a phrase. To Lenin, activity was different in each economic epoch. In 1894, when Marxism won over the Russian populists, capitalist production disciplined the worker and laid the foundation for the bourgeois revolution to come. It did not discipline the intellectual. It was precisely this roving petty bourgeois who needed the discipline. There was nothing personal or subjective or even just organizational about this. Lenin insisted that the Marxist intellectual needed the ideological discipline of the proletarians and the local because otherwise he was resisting not only local discipline, but also resisting being theoretically disciplined by the economic content of the Russian Revolution. From the start, therefore, it was not really a mere organizational question. To the Mensheviks, who accused him of acting dictatori dicta dictatorically, then all were united politically, Lenin answered. 
It is not I, but you, who have to answer how it, how it happened that you voted the main political resolutions and yet could not accept the organizational conclusions flowing from them. Do not ask me what happened. Ask yourselves. Ask yourselves objectively, politically, what happened at the turn of the century in Russia when capitalist production in that semi-feudal land laid the basis for the bourgeois revolution, but found the bourgeoisie utterly incapable of overthrowing Tsarism. Didn't that signify that to this backward Russian proletariat befell the greatest revolutionary democratic task in the world, the overthrow of Tsarism? Doesn't that in turn signify that while the economic content of the revolution will be capitalistic, the method will be proletarian? Isn't it that duality of content and method that sets you veering in all directions at once, but pretty steadily away from the proletarian responsibility? You need the discipline of the proletariat. It was these two contradictory aspects of the content and method of the revolution that Lenin emphasized over and over again. Before 1905, it was just a theory, and the organizational conclusions may have seemed irrational. What was theory in 1903, however, became fact in 1905. Fact that at a living subject, a living self-developing subject, the Russian proletariat, this working class would soon appear on the historic stage with the creation of the unheard of Soviets, peculiar organizations which no theoretician thought of in his wildest flights of fancy. These peculiar organizations, without even covering the whole of Russia, shook Tsarism to its very foundations. Mensheviks and Bolsheviks were together in the revolution and for a brief moment afterward attempted a unity congress. Two. The 1905 Revolution and Political Tendencies in Russia After 1905 The 1905 Revolution smashed to smithereens the monstrous conception of the backwardness of the workers and their inability to reach socialism without the vanguard. The backward Russian proletariat in action went far beyond the most daring conceptions of the most advanced theoreticians. Lenin hailed the appearance of the masses as reason where in 1902, Lenin wrote that the workers, by their own instincts, could only reach trade union consci consciousness. He wrote in 1905, the working class is instinctively, spontaneously social democratic. Where in 1902, Lenin wrote that socialism can only be brought to the proletariat from the outside. He, in 1905, wrote, the special condition of the proletariat in capitalistic society leads to a striving of workers for socialism. A union of them with the Socialist Party bursts forth with spontaneous force in the very early stages of the movement. Where in 1902, Lenin wanted the party to be a tight, closely knit, small grouping with very exclusive standards for membership. He, in 1905, wrote that workers should be incorporated into the ranks of the party organizations by the hundreds of thousands. The defeat of the revolution brought the grimmest period of reaction in history up to that time. Organizationally, it was once again necessary to go underground, to work in small, highly disciplined groups. It is this which has given some students the impression that Lenin reverted to the previous conception of the 1902 variety of vanguardism. Those who think so only prove that they cannot distinguish between the conditions under which reactionary Tsarism forced any democratic grouping to live and the underlying assumptions and aims which permeate the Marxist Marxist grouping and give it the conviction to carry on under the most adverse conditions, knowing that when the workers rise again, the Marxists will find their way to them. It was not abstract logic nor personal venom, but the vicious offensive of the capitalist class and the ad adaptation of the petty bourgeois intellectual to the objective necessity of the opposing class that compelled the proletariat to find, once and for all, its own native proletarian mode of being, revolutionary activity. From his very birth at the time of the great French Revolution, the factory worker found that his own proletarian way of knowing was through his self-activity. By the turn of the century of the worker's own way of knowing con concretized itself in political practice, a party. This is what the German social democracy and the second international seem to represent. 
When Lenin fought the economists saying, no, not ec economic action, but political practice, a party, he seemed to be in full social democratic, that is, established Marxist tradition. Indeed, it seemed a rather belated statement that needed repetition only because Russia was so backward. However, the fact that Russia was so backward that no independent trade unions were allowed, much less a Marxist political party, meant that therefore, what was involved in political practice was not parliamentary, but underground activity. This transformed the question entirely. Even as an ordinary person, a genius does not, uh, I think it says a genius does many things unconsciously, impelled to them by strong objective forces and by new impulses from yet undefined deep strata of the, pro of the population. Thus was Lenin moving empirically to the construction of a Marxist party under Russian conditions. In 1902, what had not been clear even to Lenin was that his organizational formulations were giving expression to the instinctive striving, the new elemental proletarian urge for political practice, which was revolutionary activity itself and not a parliamentary shadow. But what, but what was not clear in 1902 when he wrote what is to be done was made obvious by the by the Russian working class itself when it burst forth in the 1905 revolution. Lenin never lost sight of the highest point reached by that revolution, but many other intellectuals under the whip of the counter-revolution took flight into everything from God-seeking to liquidationism. Lenin hit back with everything he had, sometimes quite crudely, as in materialism and imperial criticism, sometimes very profoundly, as in his strict relating of political tendencies to the objective movement, always uncompromisingly. In 1910, he summed up the historical significance of that internal party struggle in Russia. He took issue with Trotsky's statement that it is an illusion to imagine that Mensheviks and Bolsheviks struck deep roots in the depths of the, of the pro of the proletariat because that was not the question at all. Trotsky's philosophy of history is summed up in his own analysis of the differences between these two tendencies. He was a member of neither. He insisted that it was all a struggle for influence over the politically immature proletariat. Lenin replied, this is a specimen of the, of the sonorous but empty phrases of which Trotsky is master. The roots of the divergence between Menshevism and Bolshevism lie not in the depths of the proletariat, but in the economic content of the Russian Revolution. By ignoring this content, Martov and Trotsky deprived themselves of the possibility of understanding the historic meaning of the internal party struggle in Russia. The crux of the matter is not whether the theoretical stratum or fuck. The crux of the matter is not whether the theoretical formulation of differences have penetrated deep into this or that stratum of the proletariat, but the fact that the economic conditions of the revolution of 1905 brought the proletariat into hostile relations with the liberal bourgeoisie, not only over the question of improving the conditions of life of the workers, but also over the agrarian question, over all the political questions of the revolution, etc. To speak of the struggle of the trends in the Russian Revolution and to distribute labels such as sectarianism, lack of culture, etc., not to utter a word about the fundamental economic interests of the proletariat, of the liberal bourgeoisie, and of the democratic peasantry, is tantamount to stooping to the level of vulgar journalists. Where many, and there were among them Bolsheviks as well as Mensheviks, non-factionalists and non-parliamentarians, where many took flight under the whip of the counter-revolution, Lenin was steeled by it because he took the highest point reached by the revolution and built from there. Therefore, from that time on, to consider any serious progressive role for the liberal bourgeoisie was utopian and reactionary. It was the role of the proletariat and its relationship to the peasantry that had to gain ever greater pr precision. He called it the revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry. The Mensheviks, on the other hand, held that since it was, it was a bourgeois revolution, therefore the bourgeoisie must lead it. For Lenin, not only were such practical views good for nothing,
but so was Trotsky's permanent revolution. That was the theory that the revolution would not stop at the bourgeois phase, but continue straight on to socialism and the dictatorship of the proletariat. It was not the role of the proletariat in a socialist revolution that was in question, argued Lenin, but its role in a bourgeois revolution in a country that is overwhelmingly peasant. Whoever wants to approach socialism by any other path than that of political democracy will inevitably arrive at absurd and reactionary conclusions, both economic and political. Whoever hides the fact that the economic content of the revolution in Russia is bourgeois, Lenin wrote, helps the bourgeoisie. Whoever evades the fact that its method nevertheless will be proletarian cannot define the Marxist party's relationship to it. Whoever fails to see that it cannot be other than democratic, the widest, broadest, deepest democracy, such as the bourgeoisie can never realize, involving millions, dooms the Marxist party to isolation and dooms the revolution to defeat as well. Just as the 1905 revolution and counter-revolution prepared the Russian masses, for the successful revolution of 1917, so it shaped Lenin's mind. What runs through it like a red thread is this closeness to the Russian masses. He never at any time had any conception of the party as an elite in the sense in which our, our age uses the term. Three, what was new on the party question in the great divide and after the relationship of the masses to the party? Actuality and thought, or the idea, are often absurdly opposed. Thoughts in such a case is, on the one hand, the synonym for a subjective conception, plan, intention, or the like, just as the actuality, on the other, is made synonymous with external and sensible existence. <coughs> for on the one hand, ideas are not confined to our heads nearly, nor is the idea, upon the whole, so feeble as to leave the question of its actualization or non-actualization dependent on our will. The idea is rather absolutely active as well as actual. And on the other hand, actuality is not so bad and irrational as it is supposed to be by the practical men, who are either without thought altogether or have quarreled with thought and have been worsted in the, in the contest. That quote is from Hegel. Prior to 1914, the contradiction in Lenin between the practicing revolutionary dialectician and the thinking Kotskian reflects the contradiction in Russian society whose singular development from the feudal monarchy to the bourgeois monarchy was through proletarian methods of struggle. It was the extreme contradiction in the development of the Russian economy and the manifold but concrete struggles of political tendencies which prepared Lenin for the break in thought which the collapse of the Second International signified in life. As he returned to the philosophic foundations of Marx and Hegel, he went there with all this rich and contradictory experience behind him. The break in thought, the battle of reason, now was to break up the rigidity to which Kotskian understanding had reduced everything. Prior to 1914, Lenin had accepted a series of abstractions party mass revolution. Except for Russia, he never contrasted these with the struggles of the revolutionary masses, even as he had previously failed to analyze the latest phase of world capitalism and had failed to see the connection of the Second International with it. It is only now that he saw that not only had capitalism changed, <clears throat> so had the labor organization because so had the labor living off the super profits of capitalist imperialism. Now that he fully analyzed the objective reasons for the collapse of the international, he questioned the Social Democratic Party's very use of the phrase mass organization. He denied it was a mass organization. On a much higher, that is more complex historical scale, Lenin's problems and views here parallel the position of Marx and his struggle with the British trade unions, whose leadership began to take flight from the first international during the Paris Commune. According to the Protocol of Marin, during the September 20th, 1871 conference, conference on trade unions, Marx stated that the trade union represents an aristocratic minority. The poorly paid worker cannot belong to it. 
The great mass of workers whom the economic development daily drives from the country to the city remain outside of the trade union for a long time, and the most poverty-stricken mass does not go into it at all. The same is true of workers born and raised on the east end of London, amongst, among whom only one out of ten belongs to the trade union. The peasants never join these societies. Trade unions by themselves are impotent. They remain a minority. They have no authority over the mass of the proletarians, while the international shows a direct influence among these people. It is first now that Lenin discovered Marx's and Engels's analysis of the bourgeoisification of the British proletariat. Lenin first now sensed the emphasis on the need to go deeper and lower into the working class. Although the founders of modern socialism had carried on this fight all the way from 1858 to 1892, he saw it for the first time. He saw it with the eyes of one who had just gone through the collapse of the Second International. He called this, just this, going deeper and lower into the working class, the quintessence of Marxism. After questioning the German social democracy's claim to being a proletarian mass organization, he concluded that, above all, a Marxist would have to answer, organization of proletariat for what purpose? His mind working dialectically, Lenin now approaches the problem from two levels. One, the real, and two, the ideal springing from the real. The betrayal of the proletariat by the second left, no doubt, The betrayal of the proletariat of the second left no doubt that, far from being an ideal organization, it had become the enemy of the purpose for which it was formed, to organize the revolutionary activity of the masses. No doubt the corruption of the second was unavoidable under the growth of monopoly capitalism and imperialism. But having traced its objective basis, that is to say the economic roots, his mind found it all the more necessary to see it philosophically and to go forward from the recognition of the contradiction in every single thing to its resolution. If the unity of opposites is not limited to the two fundamental classes in society, if the duality extends to labor itself, then one must speak out the truth. The labor party itself is bourgeois. It is thus necessary to drive a wedge between the opposites in labor itself. It was the deeper and lower layers in and outside the party that would have to restore labor to its revolutionary being. The masses would do more than regain their self-activity when they finally destroyed the bourgeois labor party. In overcoming that barrier, the working class will finally find itself undivided against itself. Its knowing, its consciousness, will be reunited with its being, its creative activity. The type of party it creates would not shirk taking power. What was still not clear was what type of organization the spontaneous workers' revolt would form. Lenin did not think of the Soviet. It was now January 1917. He had long, long since broken with the Second International. He had called for the formation of a new Third International. He had long since said that the only way out of the war was to turn the imperialist war into a civil war. The imperialist slaughter had now been going on for nearly three years. He did not know that he would live to see the revolution, but he was sure the youth would, and it was the Swiss youth he addressed in January 1917 on the Rav Russian Revolution of 1905. He singled out not the Soviet, but the mass strike as the outstanding feature. The following month, the February-March revolution broke out, in eight days, the monarchy, which had maintained itself for centuries and had withstood the revolution of 1905, was overthrown. When he heard of the February Revolution, he sent, he sent his co-leaders a telegram, which showed that his mind was still operating within old categories. Combine legal and illegal work. Read his first telegram. The very next day, the newness, the truth dawned upon him, finally. The Russian workers had, on their own, re recreated that peculiar organization, the Soviet, 
and now it had spread through the length and breadth of the whole land. There were Soviets of workers, Soviets of sol soldiers, Soviets of peasants. The Russian workers alone had remembered. Not a single theoretician, including Lenin, had thought of Soviets or told the workers to build them. The workers' own creative energies had built this alternative form of government. <clears throat> it continued to stand there challenging, challengingly, though the Tsar was overthrown and there was a now there was now a provisional democratic government headed by Kerensky, socialist. Now that Lenin finally comprehended the Soviet fully, he realized that he never had really seen it before, not as the form that would supersede the Paris Commune and become the workers' uh, state itself. Lenin's mind leapt forward with the surge of the spontaneous movement of the workers, which revealed what Engels had long since called their latent socialism. I'm afraid, Lenin now wrote his colleagues from his exile as he prepared to return to Russia, that the epidemic of sheer enthusiasm may now spread in Pe Petrograd without a systematic effort towards the creation of a party of a new type, which must in no way resemble those of the Second International. Never again along the lines of the Second International. And again, our immediate problem is organization, not in the sense of affecting ordinary organization by ordinary methods, but in the sense of drawing in large masses and embodying in, in this organization military, state, and national economic problems. What was, what was to become the famous April Thesis was taking shape. Heretofore, the break had been against Kotsky, then against Bukharin. Now the big break was to be with his own past. The contradictions had been in himself. The workers had broken out of all old shackles and were creating a truly new way of life for millions. He must now break with all that stood in the way of this elemental surge for freedom, for peace, for bread, for land. The first thing he did was to discard the old slogan, the democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry. The democratic revolution, he now said, has been completed. An entirely new, unforeseen situation has arisen, that of a dual power. On the one hand stood the provisional government, which was still carrying on the war. On the other stood the Soviets themselves, which wanted peace. Had the creative impulse of the Russian masses not created the Soviets, the Russian revolution would have been hopeless. But now, with socialism looking out all windows, all politics stemmed from that. Only the Soviets could create a new order. What was needed now was the arming of the proletariat, strengthening and broadening and developing the role and power of the Soviets. All the rest is mere phrases and lies and the self-deception of politicians of the liberal and radical stamp. It was not that the workers must support the government. It was that the provisional government must support the workers. All power to the Soviets. His Bolshevik colleagues, no less than the Mensheviks, thought that Lenin had come home from another planet altogether, and Pravda published his thesis as an individual viewpoint. Where to the others it seemed as if he forgot about the role of the party, to Lenin a vanguard party now was such only because in April 1917, it represented the revolutionary masses. As he was to tell his co-leaders and his party in the next few months, as he mobilized them for just this purpose of reflecting the will of the revolutionary masses, the ranks of the party are 10 times more revolutionary than the leaders, and the masses outside are 10 times more revolutionary than the ranks. He told them if they would not place the question of workers' power on the order of the day, he would go to the sailors. I am compelled to tender my resignation from the Central Committee, which I hereby do, reserving for myself the freedom to agitate among the rank and file of the party and at the party congress. But he didn't have to go to that extreme before the party finally did become the vanguard. That is to say, when they finally saw that without the spontaneity, the creative energies of millions, the masses as reason, which the creative or which meant concretely their form of organization to have power, the Marxist party would indeed be nothing but an elite, or but an elite. The method of winning his party was this total concept which he now had. 
Not only were economics, politics, and philosophy not three separate constituent parts, the point was that unless all struggle, the activity of the masses themselves... Oh, fuck. I missed the line. The point was that unless all, as a totality, are taken in strict relationship to the actual class struggle, the activity of the masses themselves, it would be nothing but project hatching. The foundation was, of course, economics. And the new, the concretely new, was that monopoly had evolved into state monopoly. That meant that planlessness had ceased. There is no such thing, however, as pure plan. The class character of the plan must now be fought relentlessly. To the government's plan, he counterposed workers' control. Control and accounting by workers, he warned, must not be confused with the question of a scientific educated staff of engineers and agron agronomists, etc. Nationalization without workers' control meant nothing. The workers must sweep aside high sounding phrases, promises, declarations, projects evolved in the center by bureaucrats who are always ready to draw up the most ostent ostentatious plans, rules, regulations, and standards. Down with all this lying, down with all this hullabaloo of the bureaucratic and bourgeois project mongering that has everywhere collapsed with a crash. Down with this habit of procrastination. The workers must demand immediate establishment of control, in fact, to be exercised by the workers themselves. The workers became the center of everything in Lenin's mind. Everything else was subordinate to it. I calculate solely and exclusively on the workers, soldiers, and peasants able to tackle able to tackle better than the officials, better than the police, the practical and difficult problems of increasing the production of foodstuffs and their better distribution, the better provision of soldiers, etc., etc. Lenin now sat down to work out his theory. As he had lived with the science of logic in the writing of imperialism, so now here he re recreated Marx's civil war in France for his country and his epoch as state and revolution, basing himself on Marx's concept that centralized state power with its ubiquitous organs of standing army, police, bureaucracy, clergy, and judicature are organs brought after the plan of a systematic and hierarchic division of labor. Lenin now saw that the need of his time was to destroy bureaucratism. There is no other way to wither away the state. Even the worker state cannot wither away unless the workers organized as the ruling class are to become the basis for the end of all class rule. That now became the key to his theory and his practice. It was a new organization of thought in the true Hegelian Marxi Marxian manner. In his book, Lenin writes against Kotsky's, Kotsky's conceptions, not only in the period when he became a traitor to the workers' cause, but when he was the established Marxist theoretician. He explains that even in his most revolutionary works, Social Revolution and the Road to Power, Kotsky had developed ideas that certain enterprises cannot do without a bureaucratic organization, and even Marxists could not do without officials in the party and the trade unions. <clears throat> this, Lenin now says, is the essence of bureaucracy, and until the capitalists are expropriated, even proletarian officials will be will be bureaucratized to some extent. For Lenin, democracy under capitalism is mutilated by wage slavery. This is why, and the only reason why, this is the essence of bureaucracy. The only way to have genuine democracy is to have proletarian democracy, to suppress bureaucracy and give all powers to the workers. That is why it is important to establish from the start immediate introduction of control and superintendence by all so that all shall become bureaucrats. The essence of a commune type of government is that the mass of the population will rise to independent participation, not only in voting and elections, but also in the everyday administration of affairs. The population to a man must manage production in the state. That is the ideal which must become the reality. 
There have been self-avowed Marxists whose own narrow vision led them to the conclusion that Lenin's state and revolution was nothing but a rewrite of Marx's civil war in France. They fail to see that to rewrite civil war in France on the eve of a revolution in Russia is a creative act. It meant cleansing the concept of superseding the bourgeois state of its second internationalist perversion, which, which was not a literary perversion, but a, per, but a perversion of a working class movement and aspiration. In counterposition, Lenin put his theoretical emphasis on the concept of all to a man to run their own lives. No police, no army, no officialdom, every worker, every peasant, every toiler, everyone who is exploited, the whole population to a man. That was Lenin's vision, and that is what he aimed at in practice. The masses to Lenin were not a means to reach an end, socialism. Their self-activity is socialism. All of this sharpened sense of self-movement as the inner core of the dialectic, all of this sharpened sense of the opposition of dialectics to eclectics as the central philosophic concept of revolution was, of course, not a study of past revolutions. It was the preparation for the coming one in Russia. As Lenin approached the section of the book which was to deal with the Russians or the Russian scene, the actual November revolution broke out. Such an interruption, he wrote in the postscript to the unfinished state and revolution, can only be welcomed. And having led the first proletarian revolution to victory, Lenin addressed the Congress of Soviets on January 24, 1918. In introducing workers' control, we knew it would take some time before it spread to the whole of Russia. But we wanted to show that we recognized only one road. Changes from below. We wanted the we wanted the workers themselves to draw up from below the new principle of economic conditions. The greatest test of all was now at hand, practice. <laughs>